As you're taking your seats, I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 1. And we're going to continue this journey uh, through the book of 1 Timothy. Um, before I get into the heart of the message, um, appreciated our students that were singing this morning. Uh, that was a great blessing, as was all the music. I uh, just want to encourage you parents to pray for students uh, grandparents, pray for your grandchildren who are in that stage of life. Um, as Josh was reading the text from Matthew 28 earlier and praying that we would see the world uh, through God's eyes, I do keep in mind that as we sit here, some, somewhere between 2.7 and 3.2 billion people on this planet are considered unreached. Many of those are unengaged, and uh, these people are going to need gospelizers are going to need people like like some of you young people and some middle-aged people and some that are in retirement or moving toward retirement to consider if the Lord would have um, us to be a part of getting the gospel to the ends of the earth well it was a great blessing this morning to um, have Cindy Davidson walk and uh, see her in the lobby Cindy is a member was a member of Woolsey many years back not too many, that makes you sound old, Cindy, sorry. But Cindy uh, and Troy and their two boys were one of the first, first or second family that joined Woolsey um, when I came here 34, 35 years ago. And uh, her sons, of course, have, have grown, are grown now, and uh, they're at Bryan College where they're um, one's a men's soccer coach. Jeremy was our student pastor for a while. And the other is strength and conditioning coach. And they're making a great kingdom impact at Bryan College. And Cindy, we love you and Troy and your family. And uh, just a blessing to see you this morning. She's down here for business and uh, wanted to make, make opportunity to get to church. So we're glad that she did. And then uh, Miss Pat told me, Pat Cooper, a uh, little, this is, this is sad. This was exciting to share about the Davidsons. Pat shared that. Uh, this may be her last Sunday with us that her son is helping her make a transition to assisted living in Bindings, Georgia. And she thinks it's next Sunday or makes, uh, that's what I thought you said. So, uh, Miss Pat, you will always be loved here at Woolsey. And we, we're going to miss you very badly. And uh, you be sure if you know Miss Pat to speak to her and uh, wish her well. Yeah, we are going to miss you. And so along with, um, with what Christy said about Arte, yes. What did I say? Pat Cooper? Well, I told you I've been here 35 years. I'm getting old, so. <laughs> Pat Cooper, sorry. Pat Waldrop, Pat Waldrop. Okay, Pat Waldrop that I've known for about 35 years. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. Okay, let me see if I can improve on the sermon. Let's, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. And I want to read the text beginning in verse number 12. This is on page 991 in, your, in the Bible in the chair in front of you if you don't have a copy of God's Word. 991. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. I thank Him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because He judged me faithful, appointing me to His service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor and insolent opponent but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus church let's bow our heads and pray together father as we open your word we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds Father, I pray for any who are distracted or burdened, for any who are heavy-hearted, for anything that might cloud out the teaching of your word. Oh, Lord, would you 
in these moments, allow us to focus in to what you have to say to us. God, I do thank you for Pat. Thank you for her faithful journey here at Woolsey. Thank you for how she loved us well and served in this church. Thank you for the memory of Steve. And Lord, as he's gone on to your presence, we we pray for Pat as she makes this transition to live near her son. And we pray that you will encourage her greatly. Thank you for Cindy and Troy. Thank you for Cindy's uh, service here, the years that she was a part of this church. And even uh, her role in the team that helped us relocate and build this building and that we enjoy today. So Lord, will you now speak to us? Would you fill me with your spirit and enable me to preach your word in Jesus name? Amen. On April 11th, 1970, Apollo 13 took off from earth on its journey to the moon. And two days into that journey, about 199,000 miles from Earth, there was an explosion of an oxygen tank. The spacecraft was rocked, and suddenly there was a minimal availability of drinkable water and breathable air, and they were in serious trouble. Mission Control initially thought there was just a malfunction with the instruments that they were looking at, and then those words that are so famous now came across Houston we've had a problem in that moment with that spacecraft nearly 200,000 miles from earth the lives of those three men were in the hands of those in mission control and in that moment the the movement from getting them safely from earth to moon and back suddenly became a rescue mission for their spacecraft was disabled, and in their profession of pilots or former pilots and test pilots, they, they were calm, and they were, uh, the, the eyes of the world and the ears of the world and the prayers of the world were riveted on that. How many of you remember that? Just raise your hand. A couple of old people in here, like me. So that's 1970. I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. But I remember it too. I was uh, 12 or 13 years old, and, and I, I can remember, even as a young boy, how serious that was, and even then understanding, wow, that's, that's going to be something if they're able to get those men home. Well, they were able to successfully get them home. They, they were able to, to return to earth. Um, the pictures show some of that, the, the men in mission control. I did a fairly good bit of reading about this event because most of it was my memory from, uh, from my childhood. But the average age of the engineers in Mission Control was 27 years old. So that was quite a feat. And then uh, to get them safely home, I believe one of those men uh, passed away early, young in life. The best I know, two are still living but what I tell you that to say that those that rolled up their sleeves and said, we have a very important job, we've got to serve their well-being. We have to work together to bring them safely home. I tell you that to say that God has given his church a rescue mission. God calls every Christian to be a part of bringing people to a heavenly home, of bringing people to spiritual growth, spiritual maturity, to salvation and to spiritual growth. God calls his church to do that. He's entrusted that responsibility to his church. And the text I read in 1 Timothy gives us some motivations because I think there are times that, that we all need to be remotivated, to reconsider it. So from this text that I read in 1 Timothy chapter 1, I want to give you three motivations that I believe will help us as we consider the fact that God has appointed every Christian to serve. Every Christian has that job of bringing the lost safely home, of helping those who are in that journey, who are 
dehydrated spiritually, who, who cannot inhale enough oxygen to sustain them, spiritual life. They, God's given his church this task to help bring people to safety. So motivation number one, this is in your outline, revisit the gospel. Verse number 11, where, where we looked at last Sunday, Paul spoke of the glory of the gospel of the blessed God with, it, with, with which he's been entrusted. And the thought of the magnitude of the gospel that was entrusted to Paul led him to just marvel at his experience of God's grace. Paul just never ceased to get over it and never ceased to forget the fact that God had rescued him. And so he, he thanks God who has given him strength. He thanks him who has given him strength, Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's the reason for his, his thanksgiving, because he was judged faithful. It, it wasn't that Paul initiated this, God initiated it. And so thanksgiving wells up in him as he considers the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. All he can do as he thinks about the gospel of the glory of the blessed God is to give thanks and praise to God. Why? Because he appointed him to his service. He's stressing again God's initiative. So how do you revisit the gospel? Well, the idea of revisiting makes me think of something that Jerry Bridges, in a book called The Disciplines of Grace, wrote about. Jerry Bridges did not originate this. It really goes back to the days of the Puritans. But it's really about preaching the gospel to yourself. You revisit the gospel by rehearsing it, by reminding yourself of what the gospel is, of going back to it, of revisiting the fact that God made us with a purpose to glorify him. That's why you were made. If you ever want to ask the question, why am I on this planet? Why was I created? Why am I here? You were made by a powerful God who created you to glorify him, to worship him. That is the chief end of man, to know and worship and glorify God forever. And so while God made us for this purpose, sin, which is living our lives independently of God, took us far from God. And the consequences of sin always bring separation from God, not only in this life, but in eternity. Because you're a living soul, God breathed into you, your nostrils the breath of life into the first created man. He breathed into him the breath of life. So you're an eternal soul. You can't die. You won't die. You will physically die, but your soul will live on forever, forever and ever and forever forever. Your soul will live somewhere in heaven or hell. And so those who don't know God, who are separated from him, will spend eternity separated in hell. But Jesus came to rescue sinners. Jesus came as the way, the truth, and the life so that if we turn from our self-governed life and believe on Jesus, rely on him, we can and will be saved. We can be reborn we can have new life, the forgiveness of all of our sins. This is what we revisit, folks. This is what we go back to. And so back to Jerry Bridges' book, he mentioned several Old Testament and New Testament passages that can help us revisit the gospel. So I'll just read them to you. You can jot them down, look at them later on your own. Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Oh, if you meditate on that, if you think about that, that Jesus takes our sins and he, he removes them from us from indefinite points as far as the east is from the west. Isaiah 43, 25. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and I will not remember your sins. This is what you revisit. You rehearse this in your mind. You preach this to yourself. When Satan tries to defeat you and drag you down and remind you of past sins, this is how you preach the gospel to yourself. You remind yourself of what Jesus has done. That what God has declared is true, that he separated our sins from us as far as the east is from the west, that he doesn't remember our sins. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
brothers and sisters, that should move our hearts, right? There's no condemnation. There's nothing held over us any longer because Christ has removed it. Colossians 2.13, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. So when you revisit the gospel, you have a great motivation to serve, to join a team of others that are working, that are pouring their heart and soul and mind into bringing people back home, safely home, just like those NASA engineers were doing. Well, the text gives us another motivation to serve and comes in verse 13. I just read it. Look at it in your Bibles. And here's the idea. Reject the excuse of your past. Reject the excuse of your past. Number one, we revisit the gospel. That always helps us to have a motivation to serve. We remember what the gospel is, what Christ has done. But some, and this may be you, need to reject the excuse of your past. So Paul, as he considered God's grace in his life, his thoughts in this moment, apparently, as he penned these words, went back to his life prior to his salvation. Now, this is not everyone's story precisely, but it is Paul's story. So look in your Bibles. Verse number 13, what does Paul say he was? He was a blasphemer. That means he openly spoke evil of God. It's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. It's a blasphemy against God, against his Son. It is speaking in a derogatory, cynical, evil way about the goodness of God. And that's this man. If you know nothing about him, this was this man, Paul. He said this is what he was. Formerly, I was a blasphemer. And then he was a persecutor and insolent opponent. Kind of can put those two together. He lived to destroy Christianity. Let me just remind you of what the Bible says, how, how Paul, uh, as he was describing his life, Acts 8, 3, as Luke writes about him, he was ravaging the church, that is Saul, before he was converted, he, he went by Saul. He was ravaging the church, entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Does that sound like a nice man? Not at all. This is what Paul remembered that he did. In Acts chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. This is a, a violent man. This is the kind of man that if he was on the loose, he would be considered a threat to every Christian. And he was. Acts 26, 10 and 11. Paul, as he tells his own story, said, I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priest, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. No wonder when God told Ananias to go to Paul and lay your hands on him, that he said, Lord, I've heard many things about this man and all that he's done to your saints. We would have probably said the same thing. So before Jesus saved Paul, again, I, I would just have us know he was a sadistic man who took pleasure in seeing Christians suffer. And yet, as the second part of verse 13 says, he received mercy. Mercy that God had on him. Now, friends, I want to talk to you from two different angles about this. First of all, if you've had a messy past prior to getting saved, and that's, that, that may be your story. I, I, I know because I've talked to some of you. I, I, I don't know everyone in the room's story, but I know many. And if that is your story, a messy past, generally speaking, and if you want me to quantify that I can later but you should not see your past as a reason not to serve God there, there may be reasons there may be circumstances I'll just give you one without going far with this if you were a convicted felon you were serving a life sentence 
you can't check out of jail out of a state or federal prison on the weekends to go serve God. So there, that's why I say generally speaking. But this is, while there may be other circumstantial reasons why one could not serve God, there's no reason even if someone is incarcerated with a life sentence that they can't serve God if they're a Christian. Even if there's things that may keep you from working with certain age groups or certain things that you, the law or the government says you can't do, you can find a way to serve God. So if your past is messy, I could just encourage you, I would just encourage you to see that as a platform to serve the Lord. Without going into the sordid details, getting into the weeds of your past, a messy past can still be a great platform to serve God. You don't have to unpack, again, all of the horror stories, but God can use a messy past. He can use your life before Christ because you've got some firsthand experience. You've lived it. You've seen it of how the devil can mess up a life. But let's take the other end of that spectrum. What if you were raised in a Christian home? You came to faith early in life. You were so young, you barely remember the age of your conversion. You had guardrails in your life. You had godly parents. You were surrounded by a godly community that, that although there may have been times that you drifted here or there, you just grew up in the context of a godly Wonderful Christian home. If that's your story, you should thank God for that. You should never see that as, well, that keeps me. I don't really have a, a testimony. You have a testimony. Just as Jesus rescued some from a mess, he kept you from a mess. And that's in his sovereign purposes that we don't understand. If your background is being saved when you were young, you had guardrails that helped you along the way, then you are in just as much of a great position and have a great platform to teach boys and girls, to teach teenagers, to teach adults, to show them the miracle and the mercy of God's keeping power. So use however your background, whatever your experience is, use it for the glory of God. And by the way, for those that were saved when you were young, and you may, if, if any of you are struggling with this, and I, I can just tell you, in my younger years, I, I did wrestle with this a lot. That, well, I, I don't have this exact story of this dramatic conversion story, so maybe, maybe my gospel witness may not be that effective. Listen, friends, here's what I've learned. If you are saved and you know the good news, and you go to someone with the good news, their first question is not, well, do you know exactly what I'm going through? Let, let me illustrate that. If a person is out in the surf, out in the ocean, they've gotten way too far from shore, they're drowning, they're bobbing up and down, the lifeguard gets to them, and they're spitting out seawater, the lifeguard is 10 yards away. Their first question is not, have you ever almost drowned? And so the lifeguard says, no, I've, I've never nearly drowned. Well, go back to shore and get somebody that knows what I'm going through. <laughs> Can you imagine someone saying that? I need somebody to come out here and get me that knows what I'm going through. I'm just telling you, I think the devil gets one over on a lot of us thinking that we have to have had this story or this experience, if you're a Christian, God's called you to help rescue people. He's called you to help bring people home. So in verse 13, the second part of it, Paul perceives the reason for this mercy and the fact of his ignorance. He's not excusing himself. His ignorance was just caused by unbelief. And in Paul's case, not true in every case, but in Paul's belief, unbelief set, in his case, unbelief set the heart on fire with hatred. Doesn't do it every time. I'm not saying every non-believer is filled with hatred. But the potential is certainly there. So, motivation one, to serve, revisit the gospel. Motivation two, reject the excuse of your past. 
And then there's a, a final motivation that comes out in verse number 14, where Paul, again, we read it a moment ago, but he speaks of the grace of our Lord overflowed for me. That verb that's translated in our Bible, overflowed, is really a compound word. It's two words put together. The, the first word that's joined is, is over, it's beyond, it's above, it's abundance. And so, so Paul, as he is thinking about the grace of God, he's talking about the fact that this grace was just way more than he could ever have dreamed possible. A thimble full of grace is enough to save you. But God brings an ocean full, an ocean wave of grace washes up over us day in and day out. And grace carries with it faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That's what he's saying in verse 14. So faith replaces unbelief. Love replaces hate. What a change. Think back over your life. Consider your journey with Christ if you're a Christian. If you're not yet a Christian, then that's step one. Come to Jesus. He will save you. You have to be born again to be a Christian. You have to have a spiritual rebirth. So for some, that's the beginning. But if you are a Christian, consider the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that overflowed for you. I want you to see the value of serving, church. I want us all to understand the value of teamwork. The value of looking at the, the screens of life, as it were, and seeing that not three, but many, 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 many boys and girls and teenagers and adults and senior adults are lost in a space of who knows where or what. There's a lot of brokenness and a lot of confusion and a lot of hurt. And the 87 hours between those oxygen tanks exploding and the successful splashdown brought about an amazing display of service and teamwork. I heard it said that every church is filled with willing people. Some are willing to work and some are willing to let them. I want to ask you, which one are you? Some are willing to work. Some are willing to say, I'll do it. I'll help. And some are willing to let them. Yes, there are, there are, there are reasons, there are limitations. Perhaps it's physical, it's health that one can't serve. But generally speaking, I want to ask you to consider again, are you willing? Are you willing? Could you imagine someone in mission control saying, this is just not that important to me. That's unconscionable. Everyone in that room rolled up his sleeves and went to work. So are you willing to serve others? I would say this is the dominating theme of the text. This, this, the grace of God that compels us to serve. That's what Paul brings it to. The grace of the Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. How can Paul not serve? How could he not obey? The grace of God compels us to serve. We live in a world, church, where so many individuals aspirations have just blown up in their face their world has been rocked shaken they need hope they need help they, they need to hear a, a collective voice of a church saying we're we're going to do all we can to get you safely home we're going to do all we can to get you to jesus we're going to find a way they don't know how to say many times we've had a problem. They don't know how to describe the brokenness in their life. They don't know how to describe children growing up in a world where all this gender confusion, ridiculous ideology is now in their faces all the time. But they don't know how to sort that out. They need people that will be the guardrails 
that will be the ones that point them to Jesus. Last Sunday, I talked about this slide. I put it up. We, the folks in the back thankfully put it up. I want you to look at it with me one more time and just remember the percentage of people with a biblical worldview declines in each generation, even my generation. Only 10% hold, see the world through the lens of Christianity. The world's changed. It's changed a lot since 1970. You can see it goes all the way down to Gen Z. This, this young generation, only 4% hold to a biblical worldview. Folks, we're losing our kids. If, if, you, if you think, oh no, all is, all is well, that would be like someone hearing those astronaut, or the astronauts say we've had a problem saying, oh, no problem. You're good. It would be foolishness. So here's what I would ask you to do. This is a, an immediate application of this message. Will you take out your phone or your calendar and go to October 2nd and put down 5.30 p.m. volunteer roundup? Just remember the date. Put it down. Calendar. Either, whether you write it or you put it in your phone. 5.30 p.m. October 2nd volunteer roundup. If you come, you're going to enjoy some good food. You're going to laugh. You're going to be challenged. You're going to hear about ways that you can make a difference in the next generation. Nobody's going to twist your arm. There's no manipulation. Not going to send you out of here feeling horrible and guilty if you don't on that night decide, I'm going to serve in this way. We just want, want you to learn, want you to hear, and show you the opportunities. To that end, I want to say, if you're serving in any way, be encouraged. God is using you. If you're serving this body of Christ in any way, thank you. The pastors, we say thank you. From the bottom of our hearts, we are grateful for your service. If you're not serving, again, consider opportunities. Particularly consider the next generation and ways you can serve. Maybe God wants you to make a difference in that 4%. I told you last Sunday that 13 to 16, 17-year-olds are far more likely than their parents and grandparents already to say they are atheists than any past generation. There's work to be done. Children are growing up in challenging, confused times, and you are needed. And so that's the challenge from this text that I want to lay before you this morning. Consider how God would use you. But I also want to call you, as we close, to consider, if you're not yet a Christian, to hear the invitation of God's word from Genesis to Revelation. The whole Bible points to Jesus. And Jesus says, come. If you come unto him, he will save you. He will forgive you. Your, your sins can be forgiven and you can be given a new life. And your soul, that part of you that will live eternally, will be in heaven. And when your body is raised on that great resurrection morning and a glorified, resurrected body, you will be so thankful that you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I wonder if I speak to someone this morning that's not yet a Christian. You know you need to take this step. Maybe there's so many questions, and that's okay. We would love to help you with those questions. I, I, would, I would encourage you. Seek me out at the end of this service. I'll be outside under the tent. Others are around you that could help you with that. If you're not a Christian, this is the most important decision you'll ever make to believe on Christ. But for the many of you in this room who are Christians, I think this is an equally important question. Am I among those serving or am I among those willing to let others do it? So God, will you use your word? Will you speak powerfully into our hearts this morning from the truth of 1 Timothy 
chapter 1, verse 12 through 14. Lord, will you shape us? Will you help us to see that there are boys and girls who need rescue? And may we be known as a church, God, above everything else that wants to rescue and bring people safely home. So would you drive this deeply into our lives? Now, as we just continue in a moment of silent prayer, I'm just going to ask that you pray however the Lord leads you to respond. Maybe there's sin to confess. There's something you need to get right with the Lord. Maybe there's someone that's on your heart to pray for. I hope many will say, Lord, the answer is yes. It's yes, God. Wherever I'm needed, I want to be among those willing to serve. So you pray. In a moment, our musicians will play our final song. We'll sing together. But let's just take a moment to pray this in.